Welcome. You're listening to the Bulldog Educator Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Kirsten Wilson. Thank you so much for listening. Music created for the Bulldog Educator is by David Galvez. Podcast platform is through anchor.fm. Hi, listeners, and those of you that may be you want to create your own podcast. I need to tell you about a platform that I use and one of my favorite podcasts, Be the Bridge with Latasha Morrison uses, is Anchor. Anchor FM is free, totally free. It's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And then it does the heavy lifting for you. You can distribute your po- it distributes your podcast so you can be heard on places like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So if you're interested in making your own podcast, I highly encourage you to download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's the way I did it. It's the way that Latasha Morrison with Build the Bridge did it. And it's the way many of the podcasts that I listen to do it. Go to anchor.fm. You won't regret it. Welcome to episode 18, season one of the Bulldog Educator. This is Kirsten Wilson, the Bulldog Educator podcast host. And today I'm going to be bringing you information on fostering a foundation on the build in the UDL framework. This is where we're going to focus on the build section, or what I'd like to say, the middle of the sandwich of the UDL framework or guidelines from our cast.org website. So today I'm wanting to talk to you a little bit more about that. Last time we talked about access or the top of the sandwich or the, the bread part. And this one, I'm going to talk to you about that middle part, which is talking about build, where uh, very many foundational things take place both as teachers and for students. In the engagement column, we're providing options for sustaining effort and persistence in the build. This is where we have a heightened salience of goals and objectives. We provide prompts or require learners to explicitly formulate or restate a goal. This is where if you have a learning goal at the beginning of a lesson, you have students either state it or restate it in their own words what it is. You also um, display the goals in multiple ways. So you may have it uh, written in your course. If you have an online course, if you're in a face-to-face, it may be somewhere written on the board. And it's consistently always in the same place where students can locate it. There's also an encouraged division of long-term goals into short-term objectives. We all know that if you have a big, hairy, audacious goal, you have to break it down into bite-sized pieces in order for you to be able to sustain the endurance to achieve the big, hairy, audacious goal. In the same way, we model and scaffold that for our students. In addition to that, demonstrate the use of handheld or computer-based scheduling tools. So if you are in an online environment, if there are tools within that um, online environment where students can use like a digital calendar, that's one way to do it. You can also model for students techniques or strategies for them to do this or ask them to suggest ways that they um, use those scaffolds or those online computer-based scheduling tools to help them keep on track with their goals. In addition, use prompts or scaffolds for visualizing the desired outcome. When there's a student that states a goal or you have a goal stated in your course, talk to the students. What is it, What do you think that's going to look like? How is that going to be? What is the outcome if we achieve this goal that we have set here for our learning? And then engage learners in assessment discussions of what results or um, what does it mean or constitute for excellence? and generate relevant examples that connect their own background, cultural background and interest to the goal that you're wanting those learners to achieve. It's so important for you to have those discussions on what is excellence. Can you provide a model for them? Or let's talk this out or even let's create a rubric together of what it would mean to achieve this goal for learning. In addition to that, in this section of of, um, providing engagement um, and sustaining effort and persistence, 
There should be varying demands and resources to optimize the challenge. You should emphasize the process, the effort, and the improvement in meeting standards as alternatives to either external evaluation or competition or the final product. As we know, the process is just as important as the final product. And understanding what you learn in the process is also very important. So having opportunities for reflection. Another aspect in this uh, piece of providing options for sustaining effort and persistence is fostering collaboration and community. This is where you want to provide prompts that guide learners in when and how to ask peers and teachers for help. So provide them like a STEM or a starter to help them with that. Encourage and support opportunities for peer interactions and supports, for example, peer tutors or ways for students to connect. This is especially important in an online environment, but also in a face-to-face -face environment. Sometimes kids struggle a little bit connecting with one another, and you can be that bridge between the student that needs the supports and the student that has that expert learning. Construct communities of learners engaged in common interests and activities. In addition to the connections you make in your class, also connect learners that may have similar interests that will then foster that continued um, community and culture outside of class that then will help them as they move to expert learners and engage with one another and other challenges they may come across in their learning. And finally, when you are using um, that collaboration and, and community or fostering that, be sure to create expectations for group work. Create rubrics, establish norms, uh, talk about what does it look like, what does it sound like, what is it when you're listening for it, what does it sound like, um, those type of things. And you can even talk about what does it feel like when you're working in a positive collaborative group. Um, in addition to that, increase mastery-oriented feedback. Feedback in and of itself, if it's not done well, it really has no really good results. But when mastery-oriented feedback is utilized by teachers and then teachers have a way to um, teach students to give feedback to one another, it can be very powerful. So with feedback, provide feedback that encourages perseverance, focuses on development of efficacy and self-awareness, and encourages the use of specific supports and strategies in the face of a challenge. Um, I love that it encourages perseverance. It's such a balance between giving critical feedback and encouraging a learner. And, and I know that I've been faced with that challenge sometimes. And so it's very important that there's a balance so that you don't discourage the, the learner as you provide that feedback. In addition, provide feedback that emphasizes effort, again, talking about that process, improvement, and achieving a standard rather than the relative performance or end product. Provide feedback that is frequent, timely, and specific. And it's really important, the frequency part, because if you only give feedback on big projects or at the end or the culmination of an activity, then your feedback is sometimes too little too late and it creates a distrust with your students. So it's very important that feedback is ongoing, it's timely and specific, so that students are uh, actually rely on it, expect it, and maybe even ask for it. Provide feedback that is substantive and informative rather than comparative and competitive. Focus on that learner and that learner achieving that goal, not comparing them to other learners or in a competitive framework. Provide feedback that models how to incorporate evaluation, including identifying patterns of errors and wrong answers. This is where you know the student. And then as students learn themselves, they can even provide feedback where they see patterns um, of misunderstandings or misconceptions as well. Under the column of multiple means representation along the sandwich of build, the next piece is that we provide options for language and symbols. This is where we clarify vocabulary and symbols, we clarify syntax and structure, and we support decoding of text with mathematical notation and symbols. We also promote understanding across languages and illustrate through multiple media. This is very important in this part because this is where this multiple means of representation, we're talking about 
removing barriers of access through the way that we present this. And we know that when we can be clear or provide clarifying information to our students, just as it's and Hattie's research is proven, we know that when there is clarification, students are able to perform at higher levels. And then under multiple means of action and expression in that column, which would be the final area of the build sandwich, we talk about providing options for expression and communication. And it's so important that we provide options. If there's only one way for a student to express their learning, we could be creating a barrier for them to get that expression to us. Additionally, we need to provide several different ways that they can communicate. Um, communication doesn't just have to be through text, it can be through audio, it can be through video, and you can be very creative and work with them to determine what would be that possible way for them to have that option of expression and communication. Additionally, in this area, use multiple media for communication. There's so many different ways, and actually students enjoy kind of a mashup of several different types of media. So when you're focusing on the content and they want to display it in several different ways, really find a way for flexibility so that they can do that. And then use multiple tools for construction and composition. Um, some students, they need that brainstorming or they need that thinking map um, to help think out their process for pre-writing. Other students, they just want to write in a stream of consciousness. And then some students, it's better for them to do speech to text and just basically just word uh, vomit everything that they were thinking about and then go back and organize it. Other students have other ways that they help generate ideas to get themselves started when they're writing, for example. So use multiple tools for construction and then for them to be able to compose. And there are several different tools out there so that students that may be uh, physically limited can still be able to type or construct compositions without limitation. And then finally, build fluencies with graduated levels of support for practice and performance. Scaffolding is so important in both the online and face-to-face -face environment. So often we walk into the classroom and we make assumptions about what kids do understand and don't understand or their background information that we believe they have with them, but they may not have that toolkit of background information. So. Things like pre-assessment um, is really important. Um, also, having those conversations and creating a classroom where it is open and there's r no risk for them to express their concerns and then anticipating misunderstandings or lack of information or schema is really important as you scaffold for students. The other thing is that as you present different options for students to try different ways to represent their, their thinking and their information, do it in small pieces and build towards a larger project. Don't immediately throw them into a multimedia project on the biggest assignment of that marking period where there is so much um, risk involved that it creates possibly a barrier for students because they're overwhelmed by the task itself and the responsibility it carries and the new learning they have to do in order to implement the product and do the actual work in order to present their work. These are just a few things to talk about when we're talking about building that foundation in the UDL framework and moving towards our students becoming expert learners. I spoke a little bit earlier about feedback and I want to tell you guys, listeners, that our next episode, we're going to have a very special guest. This is my own daughter, Emery Wilson, and she's going to be talking about in her entire growing up in school, the impact that feedback has had on her as a learner and as it's developed her own knowledge of how she learns and how it's helped her become an expert about her own learning. So I'm really excited about this conversation, having her as a guest and giving her the opportunity to share how good feedback 
has impacted her as a learner. Um, just so you guys know, she is a, a senior this year and she is graduating with the class of 2021. And I'll be really excited to hear what she has to say on the topic of feedback and how it is so fundamental in the Universal Design for Learning guidelines as we develop both as instructional support for our students and as a guide for our students as they become experts in their own learning. With that, I just want to sign off for the evening. I hope that everybody is having a wonderful and safe March, and I look forward to our next um, time. Please continue to listen in, and if you haven't, subscribe to the Bulldog Educator Podcast. You can access it through several different modalities, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Have a great rest of your March. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Bulldog Educator, hosted by yours truly, Kirsten Wilson. You can find the Bulldog Educator on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using the handle at the Bulldog EDU. That's at the Bulldog EDU. You can also find us and content related to education and this podcast on our blog at thebulldogedu.org.